Um, hello, so my name is Molly Haas Wavede, and I would like to welcome you to this presentation on the Nebraska Natural Legacy Digitization Project. Uh, I will be discussing the purpose and implementation of the project. So just to give you a little background on myself, I was born in Lincoln. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I have an undergrad degree in history from UNL and then a master's degree in library and information studies from the University of Texas at Austin. I was initially hired by Pheasants Forever in April of 2018 as a digital imagery staff assistant. My job was to complete a digitization project for the Salem Wetlands Conservation Partnership. And then I was married in May of this year, and this is a picture of my husband and I from our wedding. So I completed the Sammy Wetlands Digitization Project in October of 2019 and began working with Melissa Pinella to accomplish a similar digitization project with Nebraska Natural Legacy materials. So the purpose of our project is to locate and digitize photos and other physical materials, both historical and contemporary, and this includes like maps and documents as well, related to two Nebraska BULs, the sandstone prairies and Indian cave bluffs. So why are we doing this project? First of all, to provide a conservation resource, especially for re used for restoration research. Secondly, to ensure the preservation of the physical materials. These materials, like most things, can be damaged or destroyed, so we want it to ensure that there are digital copies of them. Thirdly, to increase public awareness and access public awareness through accessibility, excuse me. We want the public to become more aware of the fragility and uniqueness of these areas. And then finally, my hope for the project is that it can serve as an example of how to preserve and share information on other of Nebraska's endangered natural resources. So at the beginning of the project, Melissa and I met to discuss the resources needed to find materials. The primary location was the NGPC photo library which holds a wealth of photographic slides and prints that were taken by agency photographers or donated by community members. Other sources of materials are the demonstration sites themselves, Indian Cave State Park, Rockland Wildlife Management Area, and Rock Creek Station State Historical Park. And then finally, I received the State Wildlife Action Plan and the Tier 1 and 2 lists of species of greatest conservation need to help me identify the areas and species that are the focus of this project. So we decided to start with two Nebraska natural legacy demonstration sites. Our first site was the sandstone prairies in Thayer and Jefferson counties in South Nebraska on the border with Kansas. And here, here's the extent of that BUL. Um, and then this is a more detailed rendering of the demonstration site. And this includes Rock Creek Station State Historical Park and Rockland Wildlife Management Area. The second site was Indian Cave State Park in the Indian Cave Bluffs. And here's the extent of the Indian Cave Bluffs. It is in Richardson and Nemaha counties in the southeast corner of Nebraska. And this is a more detailed rendering of the Indian Cave State Park demonstration site within the bluffs. So the images you are about to see are from these two demonstration sites. So the first purpose of this project was to create a conservation resource. One thing to remember when conserving these sites is that they're not just natural resources, but also historical resources and evidence of human interaction with the land should be taken into consideration when conserving these sites. Rock Creek Station in the 1860s was a stop along the Pony Express and the Oregon Trail, but after the introduction of the telegraph and construction of the railroad, the station fell into disrepair and disappeared. So here are two examples of historical images of the East Ranch. The top photo was taken in the 1860s, and then this bottom photo is of a map drawn from memory by Monroe McCandles, who lived in the area as a child in the 1860s. So just to look at these two, you can see it in McCandles' drawing, the house, the bunkhouse, and the barn. And then in the same general location in this photo, the house, the bunkhouse with the door facing us, and then the barn. So both types of resources, as well as archaeological work on the land, allowed the NGBC to rebuild the station in the 1980s. Here is an image from 2015 depicting the rebuilt station, including the West Ranch up here and then the East Ranch down here. And again, the house, the bunkhouse, and the barn all rebuilt. 
Rat Creek Station also features Oregon Trail wagon ruts. So these images show the ruts at different angles and on different dates, emphasizing their intricate relationship with the land. These two images from 1987 and then 2004 show the ruts from an aerial viewpoint. Well, this one from 1997 shows them from if you were standing on the landscape. You can see in these photos how well they've been maintained over time because of care and consideration. So for example, in 2016, consideration was taken for historical artifacts still located in the ruts. So these ruts are a perfect example of the intertwining link between the landscape and human effects on it and how preserving one requires preserving the other. You can't take these ruts out of the landscape and put them in a museum. They're part of that landscape. So this project preserves images of these ruts so that they can be maintained and conserved. Rockery Station and Rockland are also home to a wide variety of species. The Natural Legacy Project gives at-risk species of the land either a Tier 1 or Tier 2 rating. Tier 1 species are globally or nationally at risk, and Tier 2 species are at risk in Nebraska, but they may be doing well in other parts of their range. At Rock Creek Station and Rock Glen, there are currently 28 Tier 1 species, and they're listed here. And there are birds, insects, mammals, there's a mollusk, flying plants, and reptiles. And then there are also 13 Tier 2 species. So this image on the left is of uh, an at-risk species called violet bush clover. And this image was taken by Krista Lang at Rock Creek Station. When, when I visited in September, she took me to see the same colony, but they weren't in bloom. So she's graciously allowed me to use this photo of them in bloom. So here are some of the examples of images I found of native species. Um, there are animal species. You have the timber rattlesnake and the regal fritillary, both tier one, and then the great spangled fritillary, which is a common species. And then you have plant species as well. The tall grass prairies around the Rock Creek Station are classified as tier one, and this includes Indi the Indian grass species. And then this middle image is one I took at Rock Creek Station of Maryland senna, which is a tier two at risk species. So these are just some examples of what images I found or taken of the species that live in this area. Indian Cave State Park also exhibits the intertwining link between the landscape and human effects on it. Humans have used the cave area as a park for thousands of years. Um, carving petroglyphs into the cave walls, and this is an image of the petroglyphs in 2013. This one looks like it probably depicts an animal. Um, it's also become a destination for hikers and Picnickers. Um, this middle photo is of a group of women going on a picnic to Indian Cave in between 1900 and 1910. And then this one on the far right is of the cave area in the 1970s and there's a hiker sitting there. So just to give a little bit more background on the more recent history of the area, um, the town of St. Geroid was chartered in 1854, but it was eventually abandoned in 19, by 1920 um, because of the construction of the railroad and uh, in a different location and then seasonal flooding along the Missouri River. And now all that remains are the cemetery and the rebuilt school and general store. So this one, this image in the left is of the rebuilt school and then you can kind of see the general store uh, kind of where my point, some of the edge of it right there. And then this is an overlook of the Missouri River taken in 1934. So now that the area serves as Indian Cave State Park, preserving the landscape as well as the remains of the humans who lived there have been equally important. So here's the remains of the town, the rebuilt St. Jerome School, and this image is from 2013, and then the St. Jerome Cemetery, and this image was taken in the 1970s. Um, and the burials in the cemetery were from the late 1800s to early 1900s, so I don't believe it's being actively used anymore. The NGPC has also facilitated decks for visitors to safely view features of the park, including the caves and petroglyphs along the boardwalk, and here's the boardwalk in 2014, and then also a scenic overlook of the Missouri River from 2017. Projects have also happened, including the Missouri River Backwater Project, which created a habitat for different species of fish, including the pallid sturgeon, which is a tier one species. So here's the Missouri River. This is what was created with the Backwater Project. And then this is Indian Cave State Park here. So the park blends preservation of human-made historic sites with the natural resources of the land. 
The Natural Pro Legacy Project also lists tier one and two iris species for the Indian cave area. So here are listed 36 species, tier one species, um, including the Southern Flying Squirrel. And this is an image of the Southern Flying Squirrel in Indian Cave State Park. And then there are also 61 tier two species, and that includes birds, insects, fish, flowering plants, mammals, and reptiles. So here's some images of species located at Indian Cave. You have the indigo bunting, which is a common species of bird, and the pallid sturgeon, which is a tier one species, and then a few species of flowering plants. There's yellow lady slippers and showy orchid, both tier two species, and then may apple, which is a common species found. And then the forests and woodlands of Indian Cave are classified as tier one at risk, and this includes this species, red oak. So these are just some examples of what I found of species live, that live in the area of images. So besides recording the, net, the conservation of the historical resources of these sites, this project also records the natural conservation of the landscape. Conservation of the land includes thinning through tree cutting, prescribed ferns, and spraying invasive plants. And that includes removing invasive species like Caucasian blue stem, Cerasea westadesa, and cedar trees, while encouraging native species like ebony spleenwort, Maryland senna, and native oak woodlands to grow. So these photos show rockland from about the same area point. This top left photo was taken in 2004, and you can see the density of the forests and shrubs along the draws here. And then these two photos over here are both after prescribed burning. You can see in both images how the burning helped thin the invasive cedar trees along those draws here, here, and here again. Um, you can kind of use the railroad as a point to look at that. And then also here as well in 2017, how that's been maintained. And then even when I visited in September of this year, they had cleared even more out of these two draws along here. So the work continues. So then through this project, we are bringing all these different photos, photos of the land, of species, of historical sites together in one location where they are preserved and accessible. So the second purpose of this project is, was to preserve the materials themselves. Over time, the materials that contain information on these sites will be lost or deteriorate. So first, there's physical deterioration. Photographic slides are specifically susceptible to off-gassing, which produces a vinegar smell, while all types of images are susceptible to color shifting, the emulsion pulling away from the base, damage that includes tearing, creasing, or fading. And then digital files are also susceptible to file corruption and loss. So this image over here is an example of color shifting. This image was taken in the 1970s in Indian Cave. And this is what the photograph looked like when I scanned it this year. And there's kind of a reddish tone to it. This is what the original color would have been with more natural browns and greens. So most of the images that we have are photographic slides, about 25 to 30 years old. And so far, they've only exhibited off-gassing, but color shifting and other forms of physical deterioration will follow. These materials also have intellectual loss. Information such as who took the photo, or the date it was taken, or why it was taken, are all important for the context of the photo and for public accessibility. So this project ensures that that information is preserved as well. I'm just going to give a quick explanation of what goes into the scanning process. So these are the primary tools used to scan. You have I dust the slides using canned air and the anti-static brush here and here and then place them in the scanner. This scanner display here is specifically used for mounted slides. And then this is a photographic slide, albeit an unmounted one. So you wouldn't put this slide into this scanner. So after the slide is placed in the scanner, I use this program, UScan, to view a preview of the slide and to adjust specifications like size, color, and photo painting side of preservation. The second part of the preservation process is collecting the metadata about the materials. This is an example of one of the metadata spreadsheets I've created for the project. And <laughs> bear with me, this is really dry, but this is, this is part of what I do. Um, using a couple different information standards, Dublin Core and IPTC, I picked the fields that would make the most sense with a given item, and they're listed here on the far right. 
And because I have digital items and physical prints, different types of metadata need to be recorded for each. So I'm just going to list them really quickly. File name, folder, title, creator or photographer, description, contributor, that could be a person or an institution, date or date range, date scan, if it's a physical material, format or original format, extent or size, source, so for digital materials, you can find out what camera took them, subject or subjects, coverage or location, so this is the demonstration site that is depicted in the photo, notes and rights. And the more metadata that is recorded, the more accessible it will be for researchers to find what they need. That leads me to the third purpose of this project, and that is to increase public awareness. So we decided that to provide information and access about the materials, we would upload them to online databases. We wanted the databases to make searching for materials straightforward and user friendly, and we wanted them to display information about each item. So NGPC materials will be placed in the Nebraska Land Photo Library, and materials not from the NGPC will be placed in the UNL Digital Media Commons. Both sites allow any member of the general public to view them. Three minutes. Thank you. Just to give you a close up look at the two different databases, here's the Nebraska Land Photo Library. Anyone can access this database using guest login information. In my example here, I use the search bar to look for Rock Creek Station images and it returns 623 records. Then you can click on the individual image and it will take you to the item page. The metadata is located on the right side of the screen here and features the photographer, date, and keywords. And then the description for the photo is located under the image here. So this is just a basic example of how to use the photo library to find images related to the BULs. The other location is the UNL Digital Media Commons, which we use for the Sailing Wetlands digitization project. The Digital Media Commons is UNL's online repository for graphic materials, and this includes videos, photos, and comics, and our collection fit right in with that. Also, the metadata attached to each item is harvested into the library's main catalog, so anybody looking for materials doesn't need to be in the Digital Media Commons to find the materials. They can get there from the UNL library's main page. Finally, the Media Commons allows for unique levels of description. So besides the traditional fields like description or title or date, we can add unique fields like BUL location. So both databases hold project materials and make them accessible to the general public. So just in conclusion, this project can serve as an example for other landscape programs. Nebraska has a variety of different unique ecoregions. We have the sand hills, the rainwater basin wetlands, we have different river systems, the Platte River, the Elkhorn River, the Nowbrera, we have the Les Canyons, the wild cat hills, the sand sage prairies, and different grasslands. And a project like this one serves as an example of how to preserve and share informational material on Nebraska's natural resources. So that is all I have.